Hello, everybody. Am I on? Uh, welcome to the second of our fall colloquium uh, speaker series. Um, I am. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, our very own OSC professor, Brandon Chalifo. Uh Brandon actually joined in March of 2020, and he also evidently interviewed without an on-site visit. So he's. Uh, a true and actually our youngest uh, pandemic baby. And uh, so many of you may have not encountered him for the first time until today. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to this talk. Um, so Brandon actually uh, hails from Connecticut and he earned his BS in mechanical engineering at Rice University. Um, after Rice, he went on to work at a solar energy uh, generation company as an engineer. Um, and uh, he worked on um, uh, solar concentra uh, concentrated solar arrays. Um, by his own admission, uh, the uh, tolerance was too low uh, for solar energy for his taste, or maybe it was that he couldn't tolerate solar energy anymore. I can't quite remember. But um, uh, after four years in Vermont, he went on to study uh, mechanical engineering as a PhD at MIT uh, in the Space Nanotechnology Laboratory at the MIT uh, Kavli Institute. And today he's going to talk about um, building uh, lightweight mirrors for X-ray uh, uh, telescopy. All right? I very much look forward to it. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Dahl. All right. So I'm excited to be here. Um, this is the first, actually the second colloquium I've been to, but the first one that I've given. Um, and it's been really weird this year because last year I could only meet with people over Zoom, so it's been a uh, very positive change to see people in person. So I appreciate you all coming here today. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work that we're doing in my lab um, and some of the work that others have, have been doing on X-ray telescopes. There are a number of uh, folks from optical sciences that we are working with, including the students in my lab, uh, Dewood Kim and his student Marcos. Um, as well as people at MIT, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and some others. So before I get into uh, what X-ray telescopes actually are, I want to tell you about what they can do. Um, these images here are from uh, a five different, uh, very different wave bands, uh, going from the radio all the way to X-ray at the lower right. And... Um, these images are all of the Crab Nebula, which is a supernova remnant that was observed, uh, the supernova itself was observed in 1054 AD. So it happened some time before then. Um, and over the years, astronomers have observed this, but of course, as technology improves, we can see more and more details of this. But one of the things that I want to point out is that you can look at this in, in uh, different wave bands and you see dramatically different effects here. And the reason why X-ray, which is in the lower right, and this is from the Chandra Observatory, which is uh, a telescope that was launched in 1999 and is still the highest resolution X-ray telescope ever built. Um, the reason why X-ray provides such value is that you can see a lot more detail in the core of this supernova remnant. So there's a neutron star in that supernova remnant or in that region, uh, and it's causing high energy particles to swirl around, you get this really hot gas, and that emits in the X-ray band. Um, it doesn't really emit as much, or not much at all, in most of the other wave bands. And so when you're looking at the, the hot universe, the high energy particles in the universe, uh, that's really where X-rays shine. More recently, there's been uh, dramatic or a new field of astronomy, which is gravitational wave astronomy just in the last decade. Uh, and as more and more gravitational wave observatories are built around the world, uh, astronomers can now locate um, these gravitational wave sources. So these often happen when uh, black holes and neutron stars or black holes and other black holes merge. They emit gravitational waves. And you can then follow up these observations of these gravitational wave sources with other uh, telescopes. Um, and here is an image from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope looking at a, a gravitational wave uh, source where the gravitational wave was um, 
observed in 2017, August 2017. Um, and you can also see in the upper right uh, the Chandra images, which is in X-ray, looking at the same thing, and you can see things move around. But what's really striking about in the X-ray band is that there's not really much light being emitted from anything else in that region. It's really just the black hole. And that's typical. You'll see a lot of activity in the region just surrounding the black holes because that's where the gas is moving really fast. It, it gets really hot. And just through black body radiation, it will emit significantly in the X-ray band. But outside of that, the gas is relatively cool. It's only you know millions of degrees Kelvin, or millions of Kelvin. Um, and so X-rays are valuable in picking out these black hole sources, which can be valuable for multi-messenger astronomy like this. As we move into uh, the future, uh, there will be many more space telescopes, hopefully. Um, and these are three. One of them is the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and this is an infrared telescope that will hopefully be launched at the end of this year. Um, and it's able to, it has a very, very excellent angular resolution of 0.06 arc seconds um, at about two micron wavelength. And this is meant to observe some of the earliest galaxies in the universe. In the infrared, you can see, uh, in infrared with a very sensitive telescope, you can see very far back in time to some of the earliest galaxies. In the X-ray band, you can also see very far back in time, and the Athena telescope in the middle is a telescope that's being developed by the European Space Agency. It's very low resolution compared to in the James Webb Space Telescope by a factor of about 100. Um, but it will be able to actually see where these black holes are. Unfortunately, it will be confusion limited, meaning there may be many in each of these purple blobs that you see here. There may be many black holes in there, and you don't have any way to determine how many are in each of those blobs. So the Lynx Observatory, which I'll talk quite a lot about during this talk, because I've been involved with that project, is a concept that has been studied for the NASA, the 2020 NASA Astrophysics Decadal Survey. It's not yet selected. It may not be selected. Uh, we shall see. But the, this has much higher angular resolution, and it will allow you to distinguish each of these black hole sources and some of the earliest black holes. And so uh, astronomers will be able to study how these black holes evolved over time. Many, many X-ray telescopes have launched over the years. I mentioned Chandra. I showed some uh, images generated with the Chandra X-ray Observatory. But there have been many, many more. And there will be many more in the future as well. Um, but I'm not actually an astronomer. And this talk is actually about how we will hopefully make future images that are like links or even potentially better. The main challenge uh, for X-ray astronomy uh, really comes down to this annoying physics thing, which I guess it always does. So the, to give you a sense of the, what we're talking about when I say soft X-rays, um, it, the wavelengths are 10 nanometers down to about 0.1 na nanometers. You go to shorter wavelengths and people call that hard x-rays, which is even harder. Um, and photon energy is of 0.1 to 10 keV. If you want to make a telescope that is high resolution and high throughput or a highly sensitive telescope, uh, it's very challenging and it's mainly because you have to operate the telescope uh, where the reflections are all at grazing incidence. And the reason this is is because the X-ray frequency, the optical frequency, um, is well above all of the uh, resonant frequency of the core electrons of all atoms in solids. And so what, what this means, if you remember from your physics class, the, this absorption and re-emission process, typically in most um, optical wavelengths, will happen well above those resonant frequencies. And so your index of refraction will be above one, meaning your light will propagate at a speed that is slower than light propagates in vacuum. In x-rays, that's not the case. It appears that the light propagates faster. And so the, the index of refraction is slightly less than one. And you can see here this n equals one minus delta minus i times b, where i is the um, imaginary number. Um, the beta is, is just a, an absorption term. But this one minus delta 
means that the index of refraction is slightly less than one. And so you can get total external reflection, which is very different than the total internal reflection that you can get in most other materials and most other wave bands. Um, and I'll skip to the last bullet here. Um, you typically want to use uh, high density metals like iridium or gold, platinum, um, because these have a high electron density and that delta becomes larger, meaning your, your deviation from unity index is larger. And this means you can get reflection out to an entire one degree, maybe two degrees. And that's about as good as you can do um, for single layer uh, coatings. And so the reflectivity plot here shows um, this is for an iridium coating. Um, and the reflectivity is plotted on the vertical axis and the angle of incidence or the grazing angle is on the horizontal axis. And once you get beyond one degree, your reflectivity drops like a rock. And this really gets in our way of designing big uh, high resolution telescopes. So this, this uh, grazing incidence requirement really pushes us to design these telescopes that look something like this. So on the right image, uh, you can see two reflections. You have a primary and a secondary mirror. And actually this is very similar to a Gregorian telescope, except that this is at grazing incidence. And so if you look at the, the topmost pair of mirrors, can you see my mouse? No. Okay, there we go. Um, if you look at these topmost mirrors, this is actually a shell that goes all the way around. And the shell, if you look on the left image, that shell contributes just a thin annulus to the collecting area of the telescope. So if you want to build up a telescope that has a large collecting area, which gives you high sensitivity, which allows you to see these really far black holes uh, that may be emitting a lot of right, light, but they're very small uh, angular extent, so you don't get much here on in Earth orbit. Um, so you need to nest many, many shells together. Typically, nowadays, there are hundreds of shells in a telescope. But these shells get to be you know, several meters in diameter and it becomes unwieldy. And so you break them up into segments often that are manageable sizes for polishing um, and we'll get into that. And so in the end, you have this telescope that has tens of thousands of optical components that all must be accurately fabricated, aligned, bonded, and then you strap a bomb to it and launch it into space. It's this fabrication, measurement, alignment, bonding, all these things are extremely challenging and are the main uh, challenges that, that face the next generation of high resolution X-ray telescopes. At the end of this talk, I will tell you about the next next generation uh, that will be even harder, but hopefully we can get there. So there, there are a lot of interesting and valuable challenges with detectors, gratings, and stuff. But this talk and my um, research is all about the mirrors, and so that's what we're going to focus on. So I mentioned the Lynx Observatory concept, um, and this was studied as one of the flagship mission concepts for the NASA 2020 Astrophysics Decadal Survey. We're still awaiting that committee report. But even if it's not selected, there will still be some X-ray telescope launched at some point in the future. The telescopes that are currently operating will eventually not operate. And so astronomers will still require imaging in the X-ray band. This telescope requires uh, an, a mirror assembly with a point spread function, an on-axis point spread function of about a half an arc second half power diameter. This means half of the photon energy lands within half of half an arc second diameter on your detector from a point source. And unlike UV, visible, infrared, or higher, longer wavelength telescopes, X-ray telescopes have never been diffraction limited, and they've always been technology limited. As we can build better and better mirrors, we can get better and better resolution. Um, links may change that for some small aspects, but for the most part, it's not diffraction limited. So we'll... we'll let me back up a second. So the way that this is um, constructed is you have a mirror assembly up front and basically all X-ray telescopes look exactly the same. Um, you have a mirror assembly up front, you have your, your detector in the back and that distance is roughly 10 meters typically and that's just because that's what you can fit in today's rockets. Um, 
there are some gratings and other detectors that we're not going to talk about, but that's generally how the, how the telescope is constructed. So if we look at the mirror assembly here, you can start to appreciate how crazy this project is and also how crazy it is to even want to go beyond this. So the design reference mission for Lynx, this is basically what the Lynx team decided, okay, we're gonna study this in more detail, uh, contains 37,000 silicon mirror segments. Each of them are about this big, 100 millimeter by 100 millimeter, and they're half millimeter thick because you need to nest a lot of these things together. You don't want the edge of the mirrors to block x-rays. So you make all these ridiculously accurate mirrors, 37,000 of them, and then you have to assemble them into modules. There are 600 of those. And then you assemble those into these what are called meta shells. And then you assemble those into a larger structure and then you put on some stray light control, thermal, thermal baffling and some other uh, features. And then you finally have this beautiful um, mirror assembly. So as somebody who does optomechanical engineering um, and actually as you may have noticed my background is mostly in mechanical engineering. Um, this is what I'm interested in. And if anybody's, anybody does optical fabrication, each of these I think will um, maybe garner some laughs. So there are 37,000 segments as I've mentioned. There are 500 unique prescriptions. Uh, this is far higher than most other um, optics or telescope projects out there. Each of these prescriptions is is very far off axis. Um, you can imagine that you have this parabola and the, the on axis part of the parabola is at the focal plane, but the off axis is what we're actually making. You have to align these off axis parabolas and hyperbolas. Uh, fortunately, they're very close to a cone and so it solves, it makes some things easier. It's actually in optics question, but <laughs> so if you have a, a, a parab parabolic mirror, um, the prescription is just the conic constant in that case, or defined by the conic constant. Um, so then these are half millimeter thick, so they're really floppy, really easy to deform. They are made of silicon, which is a stiff material, so that's good. Um, but we also need quarter microradian RMS axial slope errors which is on the order of 10 nanometers, which is not actually, which is surprisingly not that much worse than um, typical optical prescriptions or optical uh, high accuracies. We also need to align these. So if you have each of these segments, you need to align them to 15 nanometer tolerances for 37,000 segments. Then you need to coat them, you need to bond them together without distorting them. Uh, you need to integrate them all. And like I said, you then launch it on a rocket. Hopefully it survives. So it's, it's kind of a crazy uh, thing. There's been a lot of development, not just by our group, of course, we're relatively new, um, but by NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, MIT, NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, many, many people around the world and not just in the US. But today I'll talk about some of the activities that my lab is doing um, to attempt to solve some of these issues which also may have applications beyond x-ray mirrors, but. So I'll talk about metrology, alignment, and then uh, figuring of mirrors. And most of this will focus on thin mirrors, um, as you can imagine, because that's really the need for x-ray mirrors. Um, so the, in terms of mirror metrology, the main challenge here is that you can measure cylinders, but they're really hard to measure accurately. And for x-ray mirrors, as I mentioned, the surfaces need to be, you know, five, 10 nanometers accurate. And so our metrology needs to be much better than that. And so we're talking about single digit nanometer uncertainty in your measurements of cylinders. If anybody's tried to measure off axis uh, mirrors, uh, that's what we're trying to do, except it's far off axis. They're very close to uh, cylinders, cylinders or cones. And there are many methods that uh, folks have invented to, to actually do this, but none of them are really fast enough or accurate enough or neither of those for this application or for this type of shape. So phazonophorometer is probably the most common way to measure any surface. Um, 
and basically you have a reference surface, you have your test surface, and you're essentially comparing those, and your ruler or your yardstick is the wavelength of light, typically a Heaney laser. Um, but your measurements are never any better than how well you know your reference surface, right? And for X-ray mirrors, there are a couple of things that we particularly care about. In the image uh, on the left, the upper left, we're particularly care, we particularly care about the profile along that yellow line and all lines parallel to that, so these axial profiles. We also care about how the, the slopes of those profiles, the average slope, uh, varies as you go across the mirror. So on the upper right, you can see a couple of the, the things that we tend to care about, which is the irregularity or the axial figure error in purple. Um, the deviation from the nominal black line. You can, you, well, we also care about this cone angle error or cone angle variation across the mirror in the green. And then we care about this quadratic error quite a lot uh, because that essentially determines your focal length of each, of each mirror. Um, and if you have all these mirrors with different focal lengths, you can imagine that your image is going to be pretty blurry at the end. Um, so on the, on the lower image, we have a typical testing configuration, which is a Fizeau interferometer. You have a cylindrical null that creates a cylindrical wavefront that then matches your surface under test. Ideally, you have a null test um, in reality with x-ray mirrors because of the number of prescriptions. It's going to be very difficult to get that many nulls matched to that many different prescriptions and know what those nulls are to single nanometer levels. So the way that we are working on doing this is by laterally shifting uh, the two surfaces together. We're not the first to do this, um, but this has not been done for x-ray mirrors. And, but the idea here is that you um, will laterally shift your mirror, so you're comparing one part of your test mirror to your reference surface, and then shifting it so now you're comparing the same or different part of your test mirror to the same part of your reference surface. The key is that um, you also need to worry about this quadratic error, and I'll get into that in a second. Right now we're doing this with flats, but we uh, are quickly moving toward uh, doing this on x-ray mirrors as well, which can then be tested in x-ray eventually. This can be fast because once, once you've characterized your null or your reference surface, then you can just proceed as normal with standard Fizeau interferometry. You can put a mirror and measure it. Um, and that's uh, fairly time efficient, which you need for links when you're creating 37,000 mirrors. So the, the way that this works is you shift your surface under test, your SUT, uh, by an integer number of pixels. You take a measurement. Uh, this is akin to just taking derivatives of your surface, except in, or like lateral shear interferometry, or sorry, shear interferometry, um, except that you're physically shearing the surface. And then Using a pseudo inverse, you can effectively integrate those surfaces. It's not exactly integrating, but it's effectively uh, very similar to an integration operation. And so we, sh we do a bunch of shifts, and then we do some math, and we get out both our reference surface and our test surface, uh, and those are referenced to a cylinder, to a perfect cylinder. This auto collimator, though, is necessary because Every time you shift your surface under test, you will have stage errors. That is inevitable. No stage is perfect. Um, you will have errors on the order of microradians or tens of microradians, or if it's a bad stage, even milliradians. So that autocollimator, the purpose of that is to help you distinguish between uh, a quadratic surface and a flat surface or anything in between. I guess it's flat or quadratic. And fundamentally, this is because if you have a shift as you're tilting, you cannot distinguish between a quadratic surface shifting but without tilt, which is on the right side here, or a flat surface shifting but with tilt. Both of those will look exactly the same, and when you integrate, you will get a quadratic error. So you need some external measurement of that tilt in order to back out what that quadratic error is. And so one of my students, um, Hayden Wisniewski, has um, set up some experiments and will continue doing some of these experiments um, to actually uh, test this. And for flats, you can test against the three-flat test. When you get to x-ray mirrors, basically x-ray testing is the only um, absolute 
measurement. But we do, he, does, he has shown that um, it is quite good comparison to the three flat test. Obviously a lot more complicated than just doing a three flat test. Um, but it's also extendable to x-ray mirrors whereas the three flat test is not. Um, and for those of you who are uh, unaware, the three flat test is where you have a uh, reference uh, test and then you have a third reference and by doing some flipping and switching things around you get an absolute measurement along one line of, or two lines actually, of the mirrors um, of, the, of all three of those uh, surfaces. So we get sub nanometer agreement, which is great. Um, it's less great when you look at how bad we match the quadratic. And this is because we have some sort of angular drift in the system. So this is not nearly where it needs to be, um, but it's in the right direction and we have some um, estimates of where this is going. So in the, I should say, in the previous slide, we've artificially removed all the quadratic error in both the three flat test results and in the shifting the lateral shift mapping results, and you get excellent agreement if you do that. But when you add that quadratic back in, um, that's where the, the problems arise. So that's something that we're working on now um, before we move on to x-ray mirrors, onto actually measuring x-ray mirrors. Um, there is some drift in the system, um, and in particular we're concerned about something that we're not monitoring. We are monitoring some drift, um, but that doesn't actually affect our, our results. There is some unmonitored drift somewhere uh, that we are currently tracking down. And we're basically employing both simulations and uh, experiments to help track that down. But using some simulations, um, Hayden has made some estimates that it's something like 35 nanoradians per hour. So this is kind of crazy because when you talk about 35 nanoradians, this is about 35 nanometers over a meter, right, um, per hour. These are very small angles. And so in this metrology for measuring x-ray mirrors, it's really critical that we have either really good, really well-known surfaces uh, for our reference surfaces in our metrology, or that we have really good angular measurement. And 35 nanoradians is actually pushing the limits of what the state-of-the-art autocollimators can do. And even uh, distance measuring interferometers uh, can get better than that, but not that much better than that. So there's, this is a, certainly a challenge. As we move forward, we're, we're going to implement this for um, x-ray mirrors. Um, there has to be a much more complicated stage system for this, um, but that's uh, conceptually very similar to what we've been doing. In this case, we're shifting along the vertical direction here. So we've shown that this is pretty good in some ways and needs quite a lot of improvement in other ways, um, but it's at least a step in the right direction and something that we think uh, could be used for uh, future metrology of X-ray mirrors. Another project that we are working on is um, trying to figure out ways in which we can actually align X-ray mirrors to one another. As I mentioned, this requires for 37,000 mirrors to be able to um, create 15 nanometer changes in alignment or control alignment to within 15 nanometers, I should say. And so this really requires some new technology that um, is well beyond what we can currently do today. The current state of the art in, in X-ray mirror mounting and alignment is this quasi-kinematic approach. If you have a cylindrical surface and you have four points of contact, um, hard to make four points here, if you have four points of contact, that does not over-constrain that mirror because you can imagine the mirror can slide along this direction and it can move axially. But when you glue it down, it does over-constrain the mirror a little bit and so that's why we call it quasi-kinematic. The nice thing about this is that it provides a deterministic relationship between uh, the alignment of the mirrors and the heights of each of these four posts. In the image here, I've just drawn two because we're looking from the side where the optical axis is horizontal. So the x-rays would be coming in from the, the left side here and moving to the right, for example. So the way this is, this is done is you, you have a stack of mirrors, you put on your four posts, you polish them to the right heights, 
put on your mirror, check the alignment, take off your mirror, polish them to the right heights. And then when you get, you're happy with the alignment, then you put the mirror back on and glue it all together. And this does provide a really accurate mirror surface. Um, it gives you very good alignment. This has been led by the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center team. Um, but the problem is that it's not clear whether this can actually survive launch because you have only these four points of contact. And so there's very little bonding area to provide the strength that you need to survive uh, you know, that bomb being strapped to it. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, for much lower resolution telescopes, this has been frequently used which is over constraining the mounts, the connections between the mirrors. And you do this by creating ribs between the mirrors uh, that provide a lot of strength and stiffness, um, but any rib manufacturing errors will print through the mirrors to the mirror surfaces and it will destroy your mirror figure. Um, there's also a non-deterministic relationship between alignment and uh, rib height which makes it challenging to achieve the alignments that you need. And so that approach has been used for relatively low resolution telescopes. So what we are working on is a hybrid approach where we actually bond everything together with many, many spacers. And then we adjust all of these spacer heights afterward uh, to correct the alignment and uh, make sure that we're not imposing figure errors. And I'll get to how we want to do that. Um, but the, the goal here is that we provide something that will give us the accuracy that you need to produce the science that astronomers want um, and the strength that you need to survive the launch to provide those images. So what we are doing is um, using ultra-fast lasers, focusing those into glass spacers, and that creates strain. When you focus an ultra-fast laser into glass, uh, you get some nonlinear absorption effects within the focal region that then in glass will cause a lot of melting and quenching um, and other effects that cause strain in that focal region. And you can control exactly where that focal region is just by pointing the laser or focusing the laser in different parts of the glass um, down to the micron scale. And you can control how much strain is created by controlling the laser parameters, how many spots you you fire into the glass. And so by, by firing into these spacers, you can impart this strain that then causes dimensional change to the spacers, which then uh, allows you to realign the mirrors. So the idea here is that you have a stack of mirrors that has all these spacers between it, and then you change the thickness of these spacers, and then you um, can control the alignment that way. This kind of approach, um, can also be useful for a lot of other applications like tuning resonant systems, resonant optical systems, or optomechanical systems, um, as well as uh, potentially aligning fibers to photonic chips. Um, but our interest here is for X-ray mirrors. Um, so what we're interested in again is the, the axial slope error, um, but for this we'll talk about the height error or the radial height error of the mirrors as we impose misalignments. If we look at um, having a pitch error, and this is a, a rotation about the y-axis, um, then you get this radial height error on the, as, on the left image here. And you can imagine if you have spacers at the edge of this mirror and you just change the height of those, that you're not going to have to deform the mirror to correct that pitch error. But if we look at a yaw error, so this is a rotation about the x-axis of the mirror relative to its ideal position, then the radial height error between the actual mirror and the desired mirror surface uh, is going to look like the image on the right. And if you only have access to the edges of the mirrors, and we do because um, we can't, we don't want to block x rays by putting more stuff in the middle, um, you have to deform this mirror in order to correct that particular alignment. And you will have that yaw error alignment when you first put the mirror into the stack. So we, we did uh, some simulations to see if we could actually get enough, an accurate enough realignment for that particular error. For the other errors, it's not an issue um, because again, you don't have to deform the mirror. So we built a finite element model with some ray tracing uh, and you can couple those two things together in order to um, determine as we create strain in these little spacers 
um, how does that deform the mirror, and then how does that deformation translate into optical performance of the system. This is a very simplified um, model, but uh, basically we have a primary mirror, so this is the parabolic mirror, coupled with a perfect secondary mirror. And so the primary mirror has a, has a um, misalignment, and then we are going to bend it back into uh, what we think is perfectly aligned, perfect alignment. And when we do that, we find that um, you have a misalignment initially of plus minus one micron peak to valley, um, and you sort of bend it back into that perfect alignment shape, and you get down to nanometers of surface height accuracy, which is great. And then when you ray trace that, you do actually get um, a quite a good uh, spot diagram um, with a, an angular resolution on the order of what we actually need for links. The problem is that now you need this more complicated geometry that I've shown up in the upper left. And so making that is something that uh, we're currently working on, but um, I think is feasible. But the, the point of this is that it shows that at least in theory this approach could work for aligning X-ray mirrors. Um, and now the, the question is, does it work experimentally? Um, and so we did some, some experimental demonstrations of actually creating this strain in these spacers, or in s spacers that are similar to those spacers, um, in order to see when you focus this ultra-fast laser, how much strain do you actually generate? Is it stable? And so we did this using a TISAF uh, laser, 800 nanometer wavelength, um, 100 femtosecond pulse duration, um, and it has a repetition rate of 80 megahertz. So at this frequency, what's actually happening is when you focus into the glass, uh, you're actually just creating these melted regions. You're almost creating weld beads within the glass. And then the melting and quenching effects cause some strain, some permanent strain. So we have two samples, we measure uh, the tip of the glass using interferometer probes, and we look at how the length changes as we write lines in the glass. I should say we chose two because there are some, um, you know, first order temperature variations, and so you don't want, you want to have a control sample so that the temperature change in the room doesn't affect your measurements too much. And we find that you get very consistent uh, changes in length of these spacers when you write a certain set of lines in the glass. So in this case, we've written the same set of lines uh, probably 30 times, I think. Um, and each red dot indicates the displacement, the permanent displacement that occurs after each set of lines was written. So when you first start writing in, of course, you're going to generate heat. You're absorbing energy into the glass. So of course, it heats up and it expands when it heats and that creates this negative displacement. Negative displacement in this case is a lengthening of the glass finger. Then you turn the laser off and let it cool back down, and it comes back and it's slightly shorter than it was initially. And you do this again and again, and you get very consistent results. But by doing this, what we've shown is that you can actually generate the microns of displacement that you need for aligning X-ray mirrors, um, assuming that you can make your initial spacers to around that tolerance. I should also say, furthermore, you can, we haven't even started to touch in, uh, look into how power uh, changes the displacement, and so the resolution of this um, can get down to the tens of nanometers. Uh, we expect that it can get far, far better than that, um, and that's an ongoing uh, investigation. But what's really important when you're gonna launch something into space, and it's hopefully gonna operate for five, 10, 20, 30 years, uh, is that it's stable over time. And this is really hard, it's really hard to measure stability over time. And when you're creating stress or strain in something, this is something that you should be concerned about no matter what you're doing. Um, and so of course we're concerned about it. Um, we don't have 20, 30 years of experience yet, unfortunately. Um, but what we are able to do is look at this over you know, week-long time periods. And so the um, unfortunately, you're corrupted by temperature changes in the room, and you can see that after we conducted the experiment from the, with the results on the previous slide, uh, we measured the displacement of this after, uh, for about a week, 
and you can see that even though the temperature changes, once that temperature stabilizes, uh, the displacement also stabilizes. And so it appears that it's stable as far as we can tell, but unfortunately our measurement capabilities right now are not good enough to actually be able to determine that, how it's going to behave on a much longer time scale. Again, this is an open investigation at that, on that point as well. Um, I'm going to kind of speed up a little bit, but um, we have a new system, a new laser system. It allows us to do a lot more experiments. We have a lot more control over power, um, repetition rate of these uh, uh, femtosecond laser pulses. We also pulse duration. Um, and it's all computer controlled now, so doing experiments is much, much easier. And I won't go into too much detail, but um, just in a couple of weeks, we were able to do quite a lot more experiments than we were able, ever able to do before uh, with this new laser. So this is something that we expect uh, many more capabilities to come out of this in the near future. So what we've shown is that, in principle, this, is, this approach is feasible, um, that we have uh, demonstrated some stable strain that's of the right order of magnitude, um, and that there's obviously more work to do as there is with any investigation. So I'll now talk about um, something that we're working on that has applications for x-ray mirrors, but also has applications for other, um, uh, other types of mirrors as well. And this is using that same ultra-short ultra pulse laser to generate stress and then bend uh, mirrors into a shape that we want. So we can use this laser to create modifications, like I mentioned, that will create strain. When we're talking about creating strain within a, a thin layer, this builds up a lot of stress and the mirror bends. We can do this after the mirror has been coated. Before it's been coated, it doesn't really matter. And so this can be used for um, correcting these very thin mirrors, these thin x-ray mirrors, assuming that they're transparent to the wavelength that we're using. So for glass, um, ULE, things like that, this would be great. In order to do that, we first need to understand what stress do you actually put on the surface in order to get the deformation that you want. Um, so this is actually some of the stuff that I did as a graduate student, um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, but what I want to do is uh, explain what the requirements are for this stress that you're going to put on the surface. What do you actually need in that, um, what features of that stress do you need to be able to control? And so if you have on the, we're just going to talk about flat plates for this, um, but if you have a thin substrate that's a flat round plate with a thin film on top and you can control the stress in that surface, uh, in that thin film, uh, and you want to create a particular deformation field, what stress state do you need to apply and where um, to actually achieve that? And you can do this analytically. Um, I didn't put the citation here, um, but you can look up my name and you'll find it. Stress is actually a tensor, and when you're on the surface, it has three non-zero components, or three sizable components, I should say. And it turns out that you need to control all three of those. Um, we have this equibiaxial, antibiaxial, and shear stress components. If you don't control all three of those, you're really limited in what you can actually do in terms of creating deformations that you want to create. If we look at the surface, I'm sure you've all seen Zernike polynomials before. If you have a flat round surface, we can describe the deformation of that in terms of Zernike polynomials as some linear combination of all these Zernike polynomials. Um, and if we're limited to the equibiaxial stress, so this is what the kind of stress that you get from, say, uh, depositing a film on a surface um, or uh, typically piezoelectric pads, you'll often have these. In theory, if you have a finite number, a finite spatial distribution of those, finite magnitude, you're going to be pretty much limited to things within this green zone here. Um, you can always approximate other surface height error components, um, but you can only correct exactly the center three columns of the Zernike triangle here. When we start to be able to have control over all three components of stress, now you can control everything, including the ones in the red and yellow zones and the green zones. And so that's really one of the things that, with the ultra-fast laser, we can control the parameters of the laser well enough, polarization, um, right direction, right speed, 
pulse shape, all these things that allow us to control all three of those components. And so in our lab, we've built a system that allows us to impart all of these little stressed modification regions at the micron scale into glass mirrors. In this case, in the image here on the right, I have a glass mirror that has a coating that is uh, reflective in the red uh, area, of the um, red wavelengths, uh, but transparent to infrared wavelengths that we're using for the laser. And so by, we basically have developed a correction process where you can calculate how much stress you need. You can then calculate based on some calibration constants um, where you need to fire the laser, what parameters you need to use, the shape of the pulse, um, and then actually implement that on the system and calculate things that are important for manufacturing or figuring of mirrors, like the material removal or the equivalent material removal rate, the accuracy of the convergence rate. Um, so this process is actually working now, and we've been able to correct numerous mirrors by doing this. Um, and again, these are flat mirrors, 100 millimeter diameter. They're not really big mirrors. The aspect ratio is 100 to 1, so they're not super high aspect ratio. Um, but as you go to higher and higher aspect ratio, we'll have more and more control over the surface. And we're able to drive these down from um, about 15 microns peak to valley down to about lambda over 4. Uh, we're actually metrology uh, limited in the sense that when we mount this on a interferometer, it deforms, and it's very hard to control that, um, that deformation. You always get these astigmatism terms, power terms, and things like that from bending. So, um, and we've, we've found that it's stable. I didn't actually include the data for this. We've monitored over a couple months. It appears to be stable. Um, so this is quite promising, and hopefully we can move forward and, and do this on x-ray mirrors. The other thing that's nice about this approach is that it, because you're creating stress, you're only affecting the low spatial frequency errors. And so for folks who are um, into fabrication, uh, it's hard to control just one part of the, the spatial frequencies. Um, if you want to correct figure, use a very small tool to correct figure, you will inevitably add in mid or high spatial frequencies. And you have to be very careful about that. With this, you can't really affect those higher spatial frequencies of your surface. And on the right image, you can see um, the Zernike spectrum. And in this case, we only wanted to correct the first order, six orders of Zernike polynomials, so up to the 28th polynomial. And you can see that above that, there's essentially no effect on those um, polynomials. And on the right image is the, the same data just represented graphically. So these um, activities that we're pursuing in the lab are all about trying to solve some of these optomechanical challenges with X-ray telescopes. And really we're trying to solve, we're still trying to solve, not just us, but you know, people around the world are still trying to solve the problems to make things like links or things maybe slightly better than links someday. In the meantime, there are folks in working in totally different wave bands. In this case, one millimeter wavelength that are able to achieve angular resolutions at the micro arc second level. Imagine being able to spatially resolve the um, Alpha Centauri or even the um, you know, things that are very small uh, and relatively close, Alpha Centauri is fairly close, um, or things that are huge but really, really far away. So in this case, this group, the Event Horizon Telescope group, and this is from 2019, I think, um, they are actually able to create the first ever image of the shadow of a black hole. And that really requires micro arc second angular resolution. And this has raised the question, and a, a lot of people are asking this question, not just us and not just the folks that we work with, but um, especially folks in Europe. Can you do this in the X-ray band? Micro arc second angular resolution in the X-ray band. I mentioned that X-ray telescopes are not diffraction limited. They're technology limited right now. Um, but one day, and we're actually fairly close, and I'll show you um, sort of how close we are. Uh, I think that it may be feasible to become diffraction limited in the X-ray band. And once you're diffraction limited in the X-ray band, 
with reasonable sized telescopes, you can image at the micro arc second level. Remember your diffraction limit is just lambda over d, roughly, in terms of angular resolution. Currently, uh, that's not the case. We're still 10 times worse than uh, in the visible light. Um, but hopefully, as we improve technology, that's something that we can do. Once you get to micro arc second angular resolution, the X-ray band, you can start to resolve uh, regions very close to black holes. You can look at regions of the, or at least surrounding the accretion disk. You can look at X-ray jets. Um, and all of these are very important to astronomers. So you can do this. Um, there are some, in, at least theoretically, um, there are, you need to design your X-ray telescope very different than how they are designed today. Um, and one of the big challenges is that you actually are required, unless you have really, really small like nanometer-sized pixels, you basically need a focal length of your telescope of hundreds of kilometers if your telescope is, say, five meters in diameter. So this means you need formation flying. But on the optomechanical side, you also, as you can imagine, the, since the um, wavelengths are so short on the order of one nanometer, your wavefront error coming out of the optics needs to be well under a nanometer in order to get diffraction limited performance on the detector. Um, but the advantage here is that in X-ray, because of the short wavelength, your diameter of your aperture doesn't need to be that big. I mean, five meters is smaller than the James Webb Space Telescope. Hopefully by then we'll have larger rockets that can launch a five meter uh, telescope. And you can achieve uh, micro arc second resolution doing that. The problem is, of course, the, the tolerance is required and the large surface area, you're gonna need to launch a lot of mirrors to make that happen. But it's actually not as bad as you might think, because when you're operating at normal incidence, your wavefront error reflecting off, or near normal incidence, your wavefront error reflecting off of a mirror with height error, RMS height error delta, has a wavefront error of about two delta. And so if you had to control the surface height to lambda over 60, let's say, for each mirror, uh, it would be extremely hard. You're, you would need to control things to single nanometer, or well under nanometer levels. But when you're talking about grazing incidents, your wavefront error is attenuated by that factor sine theta. And so since sine alpha, I mean, since alpha is around one degree, uh, you really only need your RMS height error of your surfaces to be on the order of the wavelength. So we're talking about single nanometer height errors. And so optical mirrors require something on the order of 10 nanometers RMS surface height accuracy. Links require something on the order of 5 nanometers RMS surface height accuracy. And diffraction limited X-ray mirrors really only require single nanometer level RMS surface height accuracy. So it's not that crazy actually. Um, these grazing and incidence mirrors um, make things, make your job a lot easier. Now, there are a lot of other complications as you might imagine. Um, because now alignment becomes much, much more stringent in diffraction-limited X-ray telescopes. Fortunately, we can do this as not just one big leap to a full diffraction-limited telescope. You can make this in, you know, composed of many modules that are uh, incoherent with each other, but coherent within a module, and still stepwise improve your angular resolution, the X-ray band, and start to explore some of these things that we currently can't resolve today. So all of the stuff that I've talked about with um, alignment, metrology, uh, figuring, all of those things can hopefully help propel us toward uh, that partially coherent and eventually a fully coherent X-ray telescope. So just to summarize, um, we are currently uh, technology limited, not diffraction limited. Hopefully we will become diffraction limited. Um, and most of my work and most of my interest is on optomechanical problems. We've talked about them ad nauseum at this point. But uh, there are, of course, many other big challenges, many exciting things going on in X-ray telescopes, X-ray instrumentation, detectors, um, different me means of measuring things in astronomy. Um, our group is particularly working on these optomechanical problems. And one day, hopefully, we will be able to contribute toward getting higher and higher angular resolution as we move forward.
thank you very much. I appreciate your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. Temperatures will be in the launched environment and their mirrors up there, and how do you account for that in your laboratory work right now? In, you know, on orbit or in orbit, during launch? Yeah. In orbit. In orbit, it's at about room temperature. Um, the, for Lynx and for Athena, the goal is to put it at the L2 Lagrange point, um, and you need to shroud it. Um, you have heaters in there. There's also one of the things that I, I sort of mentioned, uh, some of the components that you add on to the mirror assembly are thermal baffles, and that's just to keep uh, the solid angle that the mirror C of space limited to a small angle. And you typically will also thermally temperature control those baffles. And so the mirrors really see room temperature all around them, ideally. But that's actually a big challenge, um, especially when you have like a, a big shell, you get some temperature gradients around the shell, and that will cause a significant degradation of your point spread function. Um, silicon is quite good for that because it has a high thermal conductivity, but a lot of glass materials will struggle with that, especially if they're not ULE or zero dir. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the thermal effects will, will cause strain in all of the components. Um, the, the posts should be relatively close to room temperature, and so there's not going to be a lot of thermal, like nonlinear thermal effects from that, I wouldn't expect. Um, but certainly, you know, as everything else expands, you know, posts will expand just as much. At the X-ray wavelength, does, um, does the goose function shift come into play in terms of your ray tracing, or is that insignificant? Um, certainly not in terms of the ray tracing. Um, I am only vaguely familiar about the goose function effect. It's it's something. There's a shift, right? You yeah. Well, it's just your surface isn't where you think it is. Right. Okay. Um, no. Typically, the I think almost everybody ignores that actually. Um, what sort of the dynamic range you're hoping to get with the spacers? So, like, what's the maximum alignment error correction you need? I mean, ideally, you know, if you could get 10 microns, it'd be great. Ideally, it, come, it basically comes down to um, how accurately can you fabricate those spacers to begin with. If you're a micron out of alignment to begin with, then you only need a micron of uh, dynamic range, plus a little bit, I'm sure. Um, Currently, with uh, you can actually use the ultrafast laser to do etching as well, uh, combined with like KOH or hydrofluoric acid, for example. And so then you're basically limited to your stage accuracies of in creating these spacers. And if you can get down to single micron level accuracies in the spacer heights initially, then that's pretty much all you need. Typically, there are um, okay. There, there are two ways. You can do it with refractive elements or diffractive elements or a combination of the two. So that's three ways. Um, currently, most people, uh, when they're measuring cylinders, will just use a computer-generated hologram. Um, you could, but most people just do it hard-coded on a, a few silica plate. Um, so you can, there are companies, um, including in Tucson and, and other places, uh, that will produce computer-generated holograms. Um, so you can create a cylindrical wavefront that way. Um, if you're, when you go to like spherical, measuring spherical surfaces, people will use what's called the transmission sphere. And the last surface on the transmission sphere is your reference surface. So it's a, it's a refractive lens, but the last surface is typically either convex or concave concave or convex. Um, and that's your reference surface. Traditionally, that's been very difficult to produce for cylinders. Um, you don't have really the same 
set of tools in your toolbox to verify that those cylindrical nulls, cylindrical transmission cylinders, I should say, are accurate nearly to the same extent that you do for transmission spheres. Um, but that is also a, a possibility. And there are examples of people actually making those that are reasonably good. Whitworth's original like three plates for the beginning of metrology and propylometry? Probably. I'm not familiar with that particular author's. But, I mean, it's, it's like the... It's like 1840s. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't alive then. Sorry. <laughs> um, so there's, there's what's called the straight edge test, which is kind of similar. You have two straight edges that have unknown errors, and then if you flip them over, you can determine... Um, relative to a perfect line, the height error of both of them, except for the symmetric term. Gotcha. So you said uh, the 37 cells of mirrors are also account based. Uh, and I know people on the other side of spectrum, like east in, in the UV region, they use gold mirrors for higher reflectivity. So is there any materials besides silicon that can be used to increase diffraction efficiency for x -ray? Um, oh, I didn't mention that. So the mirrors are actually coated with a typically a metal coating. Iridium is common, gold. Um, and the substrate material could be silicon, it could be glass, it could be ULE, zero dirt, fusilica. Um, the reason silicon is currently used, I mean, glass has been used. In fact, the Chandra Observatory used zero dirt, I think. Um, the reason silicon is currently used is because it's uh, easy to get really nice, perfect crystals in that size from the semiconductor industry. And um, polishing those is fairly easy. Um, and the thermal conductivity is very high compared to glass. So it won't, it won't hold uh, temperature gradients as easily. To follow up on that, it seems like the state of the art is single level mirrors. And why is that? Why are, are, double, are multi level mirrors not used often for distant space? You're talking about the coatings, multi-layer coatings? Yeah. Multi-layer coatings are used. Um, they don't enhance. So multi-layer coatings are great um, if you're looking at a small wave band, but typically the X-ray telescopes are looking at. It's a factor of 10 uh, in photon energy or wavelength. Um, and so it's difficult to get really broadband performance out of multi-layer coatings. Multi-layer coatings are used to kind of fill in some holes in absorption edges in iridium and other materials. Um, so they are used, but it's it's not like an order of magnitude improvement in reflectivity typically. Thank you for the great talk. I really liked it. So for the physical later shifting interferometry that you are using. Right now, you are mounting a reference flat and looking at it from the side using another auto collimator. Mm -hmm. But what you really care is the relative tilt from your test wavefront from the interferometer and your part. Mm -hmm. So have you thought about mounting a reference cylinder just above your unit of the test? And it is fully characterized already. So you know exactly what it is. And then as you do the physical shearing, you can monitor that reference cylinder using the same interferometer you're using anyway. And then that can tell you exactly what you are looking for. So I wonder if you consider hmm. this. You also might actually be able to do that with a sphere, which might be easier to characterize. Absolutely. So sphere Just or something. something as long as you can Till measure what it is, then you are monitoring this tip, tip and tilt, so tip and tilt both in using your actual test wavefront. So you mean it would be it would be within the field of view of the interferometer, right? Still, because your thing is anyway rectangular, mm -hmm. and then just above that, yep. having a zero door made, let's say, cylindrical or even sphere, mm -hmm. and then you just whatever uh, shearing you are using, you can. You can get a very precise measurement in that, right? And yeah. you can even have a two of them up and bottom if you want. And yeah. All those things. That's an interesting possibility. I haven't considered that before. Let's talk about it. Sure. <laughs> By the way, the question is how much you are shearing. 
Uh, it's, I forget how much uh, Hayden is sharing. Uh, I think it's on the order of only 10 millimeters total, so it's about 40 shifts in a measurement. Could be more, could be less. Um, we haven't yet figured out exactly how much you need to shear before it's no longer useful. Um, we don't want it to take several days to take a measurement, obviously. Um, so that's something that, that he's trying to figure out now also. But in that way, you have a multiple slope, basically, when you have a multiples of different shearing distance? Yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah. That's really nice. Yeah, and that's what the, the pseudo-inverse really is. It's just averaging all of those measurements together in a mathematically fancy way. <laughs> Thank you. Yep.